Welcome, everyone, to officially to Authors at Drucker. I'm Dave Specht, uh, Director of the Global Family Business Institute at the Drucker School of Management. At the Drucker School, we aspire to become the global meeting place for the world's most influential business owning families. And today's conversation is uh, represents progress in our achievement of that objective. Authors at Drucker is an interview series um, where we feature top authors that write about issues impacting business owning families. Authors at Drucker is made possible from the generous sponsorship from the James E. Hughes Jr. Foundation. Uh, the foundation is dedicated to advancing the study of family governance and generational well-being. Uh, we at the Drucker School feel very aligned and very grateful to Jay and his foundation for making this possible and making it free to the public. Last month, we featured Peter Vogel from IMD about his book, The Family Office Navigator. If you missed it, uh, it's on our website. It's also on our YouTube channel. So um, feel free to check that out. Before we get to the star of the show, I have a couple of housekeeping items. Um, the first uh, of a couple of exciting things we have going on at the Drucker School is we're offering our certificate in advising family enterprises. This is focused on financial advisors, CPAs, uh, private bankers that are interested in improving how they interact and serve business owning families. Uh, we're very excited about some of the institutional partnerships that we have going on there. If you're interested in learning more about that for you personally or for your institution, please feel free to, to reach out to me. The second one is our generational wealth masterclass, which we shot with uh, Jay Hughes. And uh, if you're interested in learning more about the generational wealth masterclass and how to leverage that content, again, please reach out to me and uh, we're, we're actively looking for partnerships mm -hmm. right now. Now on to the star of the show, Rob. So today's guest on Authors at Drucker is Rob Lochnauer. Rob is co-founder and managing partner of Banyan Global. He was a partner at Boston Consulting Group, where he helped con uh, family controlled and other businesses set and implement growth strategies. He's a graduate of Harvard Business School and Cornell University. Rob is a frequent contributor to Harvard Business Review. Rob, thanks for joining us at Authors at Drucker. Hey, Dave, great to have you. Rob, I feel like your book, um, the Family Business Handbook here, does something that, that I, I feel like most business schools maybe struggle to do, and that's really to talk about ownership. Mm -hmm. And your book digs into ownership and some of the, the pitfalls and perils and also the possibilities that come along with ownership. Can you talk about um, maybe why ownership is such an important hinge point for successful businesses? Delighted to. And let me first just say, I think it's awesome what you and the Drucker School are doing and what you're aiming to do. It's such a good service to our, our field. And I've really gotten to know you over the last six months and really deeply appreciate what the whole team is doing. So thanks for having thanks, thanks for me. Yeah. Um, so I think ownership is so cool. It's it's cool because it's so important and it it's hidden in plain sight. Um, we, what, what I have found and just studying ownership with our families is that how a company is owned defines the goals, largely defines the goals that that company has. And no one teaches you that in business school. At least they didn't for me explicitly. I missed a lot of what they tried to teach me in business school, but I don't think they were trying to get that through my mind. Let me give you three uh, examples to bring it home. So most, when I went to business school, most case studies were on publicly traded companies. Yeah. And I think largely because that's where you can get the best data. Yeah. Right. So you're always learning about this. And there's an implicit assumption with these publicly traded companies, which is the ultimate goal um, is increasing total shareholder return. Yeah. And, and it just becomes part, it's like the goldfish in the, in the bowl, the water, you're just swimming in that water and you don't really challenge that. Now, over the last 20 years or so, 30 years, mm -hmm. the private equity firms have really taken a big stand you know, in ownership and it's a similar, but different goal. And therefore how the company really competes is quite different, which is typically private equity firms raise money, they buy firms, and then they have to sell those firms in the investment window, say five or 10 years. So it's, 
increasing ter- total shareholder return of that exit. And that's very explicit for most. Yeah, people. within that time constraint. Within the time constraint, which really, you know, hair on fire time constraint kind of stuff. Now, why family, one of the reasons family businesses are so awesome to participate with and be a part of is that I've never worked with a family business that has total shareholder return as its ultimate goal or even its primary goal. It's much more complex. And I don't know, but I'm I'm drawn to complexity because there's a lot of learning in complexity. The uh, owners can decide if they want to grow their company and usually first generation want to do that. They can decide if they're going to take money out of it, but also, which is kind of part of total shareholder return, but also they have this control aspect of that. And we'll talk about that probably if we talk about owner strategy, but it, it just gives a range of what looking at ownership gives you insights to what the company wants to do. So it's a really powerful way to do it. Um, One thing that's encouraging about business schools from our little point of view is, um, golly, a bunch are teaching uh, our handbook now. So ownership in the way we're talking about is starting to enter the business school vernacular. Well, and I I think as it as it does, it's going to make the family business more attractive to students because unintentionally, I think that yeah. we send our kids to business school. They learn about publicly traded companies. They don't hear about family companies, and so they they imply that well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do, and maybe it's not cool to go back to the family business, or maybe it's not as innovative or creative to return to the family business, which you and I both know is not true, not true at all. There's so much richness and risk joining a family business. Sure. It's not, sure. really, when I, I went to business school way back, you know, 18, uh, 1988, we didn't talk about family businesses. There's one little course on it that nobody took. Uh, I, I think that's changing a little bit now. Let's let's continue down the rabbit hole of ownership. It It seems like ownership should be intuitive and people should know how to do it. But but that's not the case. Why Why do you think that is? I'm going to argue both sides of this one. I think it's such an okay. interesting question. Um, is ownership intuitive? And, and in many ways, it's not because you're not taught it in business schools. It's taught at law schools. Oh. And it's taught that it's a very technical issue. You know, do you want to be an LLC, an LLP, S Corp, C Corp, and you just like glaze over very quickly. And ownership is often about minimizing risk, including taxes. And that that's kind of where it sits in the kind of the world of, of insight. So it's all that stuff is not intuitive. Um, what we believe though is that the what's missing in that education is that there are these technical things, but there's so much more. There's values based thinking, there's psychologically complex issues, and it's all really emotional. So the second thing why it, it's not intuitive is actually psych- psychological, we think, meaning um, people who are first generation typically really understand ownership deeply. Yeah. They had found their firm. They get the LLC, LLP kind of trade-offs that they do, and they're psychological owners of their firms. A lot of G3, maybe G2, but G3+, plus, they lack psychological ownership, and they don't lean into where owners, some of our some of the clients I've worked with, frankly, are a little bit embarrassed. I didn't grow this company. I'm an owner. I'm a beneficiary, but it wasn't my work. So they they almost turn away from from it, which is which is too bad, uh, I think. Now I'm going to flip the argument and say what's so interesting, I think, about family ownership is we do a lot of work on owner strategy, and owner strategy. The essence of it is, as owners, what do you want? You can want whatever you want. You can can want to grow it. You can want to take money out of it. You can control it for certain reasons, including investing in whatever, the environment. The only people who know what you want are the owners. Mm -hmm. And when you start asking the questions to clients about what do you want, first they look at you like, well, I don't know. And then you slow it down and you just say, why do you own it together? And what do you want from it? And it's so cool. We have this client, I'll call her Alice, and she's a really bright woman. She's an interior designer. 
And she has no business experience whatsoever. But if you get into ownership with her and you talk about, well, what do you want, Alice? It's so cool because she's not burdened by all this business school stuff that we've learned. She just can like purely answer the question. Well, I want it for my next generation. I want to continue the values of the firm. I want this amount of money from it. And that's, that's ownership at its best, knowing what you want. So in some ways it is super intuitive. It's just, we have to, I think, uncap it. So it, yeah. the intuitiveness of it can be expressed, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. Um, in your book, you talk about um, the rights of an owner. You talk about five rights of an owner. You talk about design, decide, value, inform, and transfer. Can you talk about the importance of an owner really understanding their rights and responsibilities? Yeah, I think I, I love how you you put rights and responsibilities next to each other. We literally, when we were writing the book, we're like, should we just have to talk about rights or should we talk about responsibilities? Because they, they're different faces of the same coin. We think we just talked about rights, but I think with every right comes a responsibility. Um, and what's so cool about ownership, again, is they have the right, owners have the right to make any decision that they want in the company. They can choose the color of the carpet. They can choose... Do we use Teams or do we use Zoom? Whatever. They can choose to sell the company. So the, from the biggest decisions to really the most, the smallest decisions, they can make those decisions. They have that right. Now, the flip of that, which is so cool, is owners need to figure out, and this is the responsibility of what decisions they should make in their system. You know, these reserve rights of ownership, deciding what those are, the ones that you make as owners. And those that you, the others that you delegate to your board and your management, so that's, that's like the most important decision you're making is what do we decide on? And that's what we try to work on, <clears throat> excuse me, with the five rights is we're trying to talk about the five rights as, at least the way I think of it, it now, I didn't think about it when we were writing the book is they're only, we're looking for decisions that only the family should be making, the family owners should be making. Everything else you should think about differently. So what can only you, what can only Alice decide on as my example, rather than all, rather than a CEO or the head of marketing or a board, they can make decisions in those areas better than Alice can. But there's some decisions that our prototypical Alice will be best at making. And that, that to me is the separation of where owners should be exercising their rights and their responsibility. Don't overstep. If you overstep, people will step away from your company. And importantly, don't understep. If you're not a, if you're not making the decisions that you should as an owner, that often leads to a bad path too. So that's a little bit of how we're how I think about yeah. it. Yeah. Well, when I think about an owner that's clear on on their purpose and their intent for for the future, and as that gets communicated and infused into the business, it feels like it unlocks the organization, the leadership, the management to throw all their energy in that direction, uh, where I find, yes. especially during generational transitions, where they're either not sure if like, are we in full throttle growth mode? Are we going to cash flow this thing? Is it, you know, does it exist for a, a different purpose now than it did 10 years ago, where there's that lack of clarity? I feel like there's a lot of burnt up energy that's not focused and i think any, that's excellent. any comments on that yeah i think that's excellent i think that um with our owner groups we really stress and they stress themselves a single voice there needs to be a single voice from the owner room to the board room if there are multiple voices one the board is confused like do we listen to peter or paul growth or liquidity and what happens then is the board makes the decision if you do not have a single voice as a group of owners, you have effectively delegated that decision mm -hmm. with the board and or the CEO. And you know, some owner groups can't get their act together. And that is what happens. Other owner groups, when you work with them on owner strategy, they, they figure out what they want. And it's, it's not, it's messy. It takes a long time, all of these things, but that's a responsibility. If you don't have a single voice, I think you have, mm, what's the right word, uh, short shrifted your right and responsibility as an owner. So pull us behind the curtain of 
you know, a, a family that's done this, an owner group that's done this really well, how does that end up communicated with the board? How does yeah. it flow? How does it kind of flow through the organization? And like, yeah. what are the real implications of that ownership group being real clear? Good, good. I'm thinking of a, of a really good client who, as you were saying, Dave, was going through a generational transition. Here it was G2 to G3. And G2 in this system, really strong. They knew what they wanted. Uh, G3, who are now in their 40s and 50s, never felt like they had psychological ownership because G2 was so strong. Mm -hmm. They decided that they needed an owner strategy. And there are like 13 different owners, five board members who are really very good business people, the other eight not business people by, by any means whatsoever. They decided that you know they had a good CEO, they had a great board. They were... Uh, they were missing an owner room. They never, as a third generation alone, got together and said, what do we want? Why do we own this together? And what are our goals for our company? And these are, I think, the two essential questions that owners have to ask each other to, to set up an owner strategy. And they worked literally for a year, you know, got together like five times as a group of 13 people and uh, it was so interesting, Dave, because there were two, this was working as it often does at two levels. One was a rational level. What's our growth target? How yeah. much liquidity? How much debt? These things. And talk through that. And this owner group, because the relationship with a second generation was tough and across the branches were tough, they also were concurrently working on their their group dynamic, just how they work together. There's a lot of stuff in the room. And until that was needed, they needed a lot of processing as a group so that they can really get clarity on this. So a good owner group gets clarity on, one, why do we own this together? Mm -hmm. Which is the purpose. Two, what are the goals? What are the specific goals that we have? And then three, what are the guardrails? We're not gonna, so if you're growing 6% real, it's okay between four and seven. Is that right? And then they write it down and they get an owner strategy statement. And then, and this is so cool when it happens well, they have a dialogue with the board. And the board, the, the, the owners basically say, board, what do you think? <laughs> is this doable? And the board is going back to the owner saying, is this really what you want? And it usually tightens as an owner strategy in this dialogue. But as soon as the board gets clarity from this owner strategy statement and these dialogues, they can go do their job. Yeah. This system before then, there was a push me pull you between the G2, which was wanting what it always wanted, which was just to grow, and what the G3 wanted, which was something quite different from that. So yeah. the process, it's not only tactical, it's also emotionally based. There's a lot of dialogue and then there's specificity. That's how I think about it. We, see, yeah. we have so many clients going through a similar process right now. It was a missing, I think owner strategy was a missing idea in the field for owners because no one talked, that's something that wasn't talked about at business schools. You talk about business strategy, how and where to compete, but you don't really talk about owner strategy, which is why do we own these together? Yeah. I'm working with a family right now, Rob, where, you know, the second generation leader was, uh, you know, running the business like a army general, you know, and uh, now that leader is gone and the ownership group, uh, well, that leader was very successful at growing the company financially and they were in good shape. Uh, but he wasn't asking a lot of people's thoughts, feelings, opinions along the way. And it was kind of like, uh, oh, you're, you're with me or you're not. But so now this, this next generation that's being asked to, to manage and, and to kind of govern this, they're very lost because of the pattern that yeah. existed in the generation before. And so this is, this is brand new for them. And I think, okay. you know, the, the concepts of um, your four room model are, are perfect for a family like that. And I want to just, if you would take us through kind of maybe a little bit of the backstory, maybe there's not a lot of backstory to the four room model, but then if you want to just, walk us through that four room model and some of the, some of the structures and processes that each of these rooms need. Yeah. The quick Big question, obviously. Yeah. The, the quick backstory in the four room model, uh, when I was like first or second year in doing family business advising, it was really confusing. 
we were trying to, frankly, we were trying to figure it out. And we were in Austria of all places, working with a great family, really big on a hundred owners and their LO, their effectively their LC agreement was to change anything. You needed unanimous <laughs> agreement among a hundred shareholders. So it was a tough system. Uh, so we we're struggling trying to say, how are we going to help them? How are we going to help them? And there was all this family conflict coming into the boardroom and all of that. And just one morning we woke up and we're like, we have to find some structures here. You know, structure is your friend. And the partner I was working with just drew up this. Well, there's a business room. There's this board room. There's a owner room. And then on the side, there's this family room. And they all have, they're all so different. And I, he was saying to me, I think we're getting confused because we're just putting them all in the same, uh, same mix. And, and he said, hey, what if we thought about them distinctly? That might help our client. And oh my God, we were like, let's go. And well, literally... it just organizes the complexity. It doesn't get rid of it, but it organizes yeah. it yeah. enough yeah. that you can actually talk about it and understand. You can talk it. about it without getting confused. We have one great owner, operator, CEO who works with his brother and cousin as owner operators. And it was so helpful because John would be like, my brother, he keeps on bringing ownership issues up in business meetings. And I'm like, he's like, no, not here. <laughs> we have an owner room up there that we're supposed to talk about that. And vice versa, he'd bring up business issues when they're talking about owner things. So it really gives a lot of clarity to our to our clients, especially I think the family. So let me quickly go through. So business room, you know, most, most well, every business we work with has a big, robust business room. And the way it runs is you got a CEO. He or she is the hierarchical top dog. They make thousands of decisions a day in the CEO. And it's all about competency. Like, can you, you know, can you get this widget to China and back? That's your job. And if you're not doing it, you're out. So they're trading in competency is what we talk about. Then on top of that, overseeing that is a boardroom. And if you just make the distinction in your mind, I'm sure most people on the call have been in boardrooms. It's so different. You know, it's usually this oval room, the people are older and they're trying to oversee rather than do. There are only a few decisions that they're really making. If they're beyond those decisions, they're probably not doing their job well. What they're, the currency of a, of a boardroom should be, and often is, it's wisdom. You have people on the board who have seen where you are going. They've seen it in other places and they're helping you, you get there not making the decisions, but overseeing the decisions. And then on top of that should be an owner room. And I say it should be because a lot of times when we get into systems, the owner room is either missing, no one thinks about it because the lawyers just do it, or it's just really messy. They've never really come together. And owner rooms are so awesome. They're only the owners, right? Really only the owners. You don't want management in there. You don't, you want board every now and then dialoguing, but it, the owners have to work on their group dynamic and figure out their big decisions. Fortunately, they don't have that many decisions, even fewer than the uh, than the boardroom. They're trading. It's so interesting. The currency in an owner room is, we say, it's power and influence. It's power because 51% wins, but rarely do you get to a vote in the, you know, 51% of the shareholding wins, but rarely do you get to a vote. And you know that the decision-making processes that you're going through with your family owners, how you behave in those processes will always be remembered. Always. Anything that you do, if you did a 51 force vote on something, that will always be remembered. And probably they're going to, you know, your sister, your second cousin, they're going to remember, they're going to get back at you. So there's really this influence part. There's the power, but there's also the influence that's being traded there. And then the family room is over to the side. And it, the core thing that's going there, and most people on the call know this, and Dennis is the world expert is at, at this, is working on the unity of the family. So many of our clients, as they're going second or third generation, like, do we really need a family room? <laughs> I spend so much time in my business and working on the board that I, when I go home, I just want to go home. I don't want to see these people anymore. I've really grown to understand, and Dennis has helped me on this, that you need a highly functioning family room to, to intentionally build family unity across generations if and only if you want to be a multi-generational family business. If you want to cut off 
uh, limbs of the tree, or if you want to sell, you don't need it. But if your intention, if your owner strategy is such that you're saying, we want to be a multi-generational family business, you got to build out a family room. The currency there, it's love <laughs> and other emotions, a well-functioning family room. It's so cool what they do in well-functioning family rooms now, getting the next generation together, working on the group dynamic, getting deep, deep with each other. And, you know, there are all this press about family businesses. There's so much conflict and stuff. A well-functioning family room for a family business is a beautiful thing. They have something that, you know, frankly, my family doesn't. You know, they they come together in the third generation, a hundred of them, and they actually know each other and they celebrate each other. And that's just a beautiful thing to see. That is. They, that's fantastic. they listened to uh, Dennis Jaffe and did the right things. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the, I think, telltale signs of, you know, how these rooms are organized or if they even exist is, you know, is there any kind of financial um, budget allocation to each of these rooms? I mean, you look at management, clearly, yes. clearly the, the, there's, mo there's money spent in that room. You know, you look at, uh, you know, you look at the owner room, family rooms don't always have a budget. And that's something that I've seen it is kind of the pivot point is kind of the pivot point for some where it's like, well, we, we really want a high functioning family, but there's actually no budget for investing time and, and, and creating experiences. <laughs> any, any thoughts on that? I mean, that, I know that's kind of a simplistic thing, but. I see the same thing. It's one of my tests. Okay. Where, where does the budget come from and what our clients see? So I'm thinking of a client where board of trustees, it's a, um, owned by trust, as most businesses are, family businesses in the United States are, owned in trust. The trustees have the power of the purse. And the family room had to kind of go beg, borrow, and steal every year to get to get funded. And you're just like, you can't do multi, you know, family rooms forever. You can't do multi-generational investments if, every year. So they put together a multi-year budget. And it just settled the whole thing down because they could say, we could plan now. We didn't know if we would have money to do this or not. The other thing I see a lot is no budget, but you can spend whatever's needed. And I, I don't like that either because I mm -hmm. think it doesn't have the discipline that any of these rooms should have. Yeah, very good. Um, yeah, I just I just see it as a good litmus test. Like, yeah, we're real serious, but there's no, there's <laughs> there's no, no actual problem. allocation there's to no it. Problem. So. Some of these families, you know, their retreats are big dollars, you know, million dollars. Sure. sure. All right. I want to pivot and talk a little bit about kind of the owner strategy triangle that you talk about in your book. Um, there's, you know, there's, there's a give and take. You can't say you're growth focused and liquidity focused. You can't, you know, growth control and liquidity, I think are the three. And can you talk about that triangle and why, why it's so important for, you know, that owner group to, to say like, no, this is what, this is what we're after. Yes. When, when we talk owner strategy, as we said before, it's about purpose, but it's also about goals. And it's, it, as we talked very early on in, in publicly traded companies, you don't do this because it's total shareholder return. That's the goal. <laughs> it's the given and then go from there. Here we had to slow things down and say, Actually, if you own the business, you have to be more, much more explicit because there will be trade-offs. We call it a you pick two problem, which it kind of is, which is you can either grow. So grow, baby, grow. We're going to put all our money and growth in this business. And that's a typical G1. And the reason they get a big business is they put 95% of their investable cash flow back into the business. Liquidity may, means taking money out of the business, either through dividends, distributions, or share buybacks. And then control means both equity. Do you have full equity? How much debt do you take on? And I've learned from our clients, we never take on so much debt that the banker's at the table with us. And that's the reason they're still around is they've always had low debt, which is the opposite of what they teach you in business school, <laughs> with business schools with, when I was in business school. And the other thing is so interesting about control and where we had the best of conversations is why else beyond financial reasons do you control this? You know, we have some clients and one of the reasons I work with family businesses is 
they're so generous. They just invest so much in their communities. They, you know, we have clients who are trying to take, literally trying to take a million people out of poverty. You're like, holy cow, if we can help this family do that, we feel pretty good about what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But these are trade-offs. We have this, this one company and we, we literally called their strategy, Grow Baby Grow. They put everything, you know, 95% back in. We had this other client, and this was so interesting, a terrific business. You would know their brand name. They were taking out more liquidity out of that company than it was generating. And it was like hundreds of millions of dollars. We're like, you're starving it. And they're like, yes, why? Well, we don't like each other. We don't want to be in business with each other. We want to get away from this thing. And I, and I think that was one of the core insights we're saying, oh, these owners really can make choices which are you know, irrational to outsiders. And then control, an example I use of a great company, they're, uh, they're out in Southeast Asia, a teaching hospital. And I think there's seven siblings, good Catholic family, seven siblings, all work in the business. Not all are great business people, but what they really value, they've got a great business, but what they really value is every weekend they get together as a full family and they talk about what was going on. And it's just deeply meaningful. Now, you can't put that on the New York Stock Exchange and say, we're going to do it this way. But families get to make these choices. And the ones I explained are kind of implicit. When you're doing owner strategy, you push it hard on explicit. And one of the best tests is after you do your owner strategy in the owner room, you drop it down to the boardroom and you say, hey, board members, can we do this? And they'll put a good board member will say yes, where it can be done and no, where it can't be done. And of course, we're trying to do that too, but to have that dialogue on what the trade-offs are is very important. I would say this, you know, the single mo the single best idea in the book is the four-room model. That's what people tell me. The next one is this triangle. It's very intuitive to owners. As soon as you go through it, they're like, oh yeah. <laughs> Here's what, and then you get off the, you give them the pen and you say, okay, lay out what your previous generation strategy was. And <laughs> And they just understand it. And then you say, okay, harder question, what's your generation's owner strategy going to be? And that takes a little bit of work sometimes. Sometimes it's really aligned, but usually that's where the core, you know, the core thinking is. I, I'm going to talk about conflict for one second, owner strategy, because it was really interesting. We worked with this family, really high sibling conflict. I mean, the highest I've seen. Um, every time we got with them, it was, it was, a, it was a tough thing. They chose, we usually say, don't work on owner strategy until you can really communicate well and the group dynamics are strong because it's a really tough issue. They chose the opposite. They said, you know, Banyan, <laughs> we're business people. We want to talk about strategy. And it really brought them together. It was so counterintuitive to me, but we have this saying at Banyan, the client knows the answer. We just have a process to help them find it. And if you listen to your client, they will tell you how to help them. And I just love that about family businesses. It's our job as much as anything to get out of the way, to listen and say, oh, let's go do owner strategy then, despite what I would have thought. And it really was effective for that family. Fantastic. Okay, I want to pause for a second. Um, I don't want to hog all of Rob's time and attention. So if you have questions for Rob, um, please put those in the chat and we'll get to those in, in just a couple of minutes. Um, Rob, I wanted to talk a little bit about, um, you know, how, how often these things get revisited. So, um, is it just during transitions? Is it as people are aging? Is it, you know, yeah, yeah. basically where I'm going here is I'm working with a specific family right now that, um, has the rising generation has not been involved. And they're getting ready to basically inherit a structure and be told to live in it. Ooh, and, and so I would, I'm curious. Here's, like, your, ha here's your house. <laughs> ex <laughs> exactly. I hope you like it. <laughs> and if you don't live in it anyways, <laughs> exactly. Or, I, or more, just here's your house. <laughs> so as you think about the rising generation and you think about the structures that exist and then also them moving into different roles, whether they were owners or, or were not owners and they're going into ownership roles. Um, I'm a, I'm a fan of involving them early. Maybe they don't have a, a vote, but they have a voice yeah. so that it can influence how that senior generation 
positions them so that they're in the best in the best spot for that generation. But what have you seen in terms of families involving the rising generation and and what influence can the rising generation have on these systems and processes, even when they don't have control? Yes, that's such a great question. We deal with that a lot. Here's what I'm learning, <laughs> I would say. I don't think it's a cook cook, uh, cook pie yet. The best I've seen is um, when before they're before they're before they're in their early twenties, clients work wise clients work really hard or a lot on the group dynamic of the next generation. They do things like, of course, like you know, let's do this activity together, but really also very thoughtful things so that they know each other. Um, Cousins are great because at least in my family, most families, cousins kind of are immediate friends, right? But you don't really know them. So you have to drop in and say, how are we going to get to know each other? Because guess what? Likely 20, 30 years from now, we're going to be making big decisions together, big, important decisions together. So I, I really like it when they're working explicitly on group, you know, things like Myers-Briggs or DISC or was it performance index? Anything that they can get to know, because now when I see, now I've seen these generations working on group dynamics, how they make decisions, getting to know each other. Now they're into the next stage, which is, I, I don't, which is coming together as a, as a family owner generation. And they don't have, they have not the big decisions to make, but they have decisions to make as, in a generation. Usually this is 25 to 35 years old. They really, when I see these groups that worked here together on their knowing each other as teenagers come together as 20 year old, 25 year olds, they work so much better together rather than what they're doing both at the same time, getting to know, yeah. you don't have the trust yet. The And the decisions that they work on a little, what I've seen, we, we've worked a lot on when you're in that seat uh, and have ownership, how are you gonna make decisions together? Well, how are you gonna make decisions together before that, and it gets them working on specific things. The second yeah. thing that they typically are working on, and this is bigger and later, which is, okay, when you're in the seat, yeah, what's your vision? What you know, the world's changing so much. You know, your parents still have voting control of the trust too, but how do you see this corporation when you're in the seat? And it's kind of a stunner question, and you can slow it down and go through those kind of things. They should be done. The words we use are long and lean, meaning you're not saying we're going to meet weekly on this, but you are going to say these are big topics that we want you working on. The third thing, which I should have said first, which is a lot of what's going on in the mid 20s to mid 30s is is understanding the system. These are really complex systems, at least the ones that we work with. How does ownership work? What does this trust mean? Is the trust going to open up? What are responsibilities do I have as a beneficiary? What are my rights as a beneficiary? Who are these trustees? What do they have to do? Getting to know that, getting to know the business. Again, long and lean, that's more than a couple of years of work for yeah. uh, generations coming together. Um, so you can tell I don't have a pithy answer because we're still working through it, but that's what I'm seeing in the marketplace. Perfect. Yeah, one of the things I'm I'm doing currently with a G1 to G2 transition is um, having G2 get together and basically make a proposal of how they how they see that they will work together, and they're gonna they're gonna propose that to G1 and and work through a couple of the t you know tough things like when we don't agree, the, this is the structure that we think that we should put in place, and it's really it's really powerful. For them to, it, first of all, it takes a lot of pressure off of the G1 because they don't have to decide and hope that it works. They're saying, okay, G2, if you're really interested in this business, you think okay. you want to be in shared ownership together, get together, work on putting a, putting a, a proposal together of how you, how you want to work together and share it with us and we'll edit it together. And it's, okay. it's so interesting because most aren't doing that. You know, most are, are kind of, G1 to G2, like kind of top down, making the decisions for them and hoping that it works. It's been it's been really a great process. Um, let's get to some questions. Uh, Jeff, do you want to take yourself off mute and ask your question for Rob? Sure. Thanks, Dave. Hey, Rob. 
Yeah, hey. question question is simply as you think of successful transitions, you know, business owners, whether they're in an operating capacity or not, they're seen as having, say, things like character or integrity or, you know, the business foundation is built on them, right? And and people can rely on that. And so transitioning that to the next generation is really, really difficult, I've seen. And so how do you see whether it's mentoring, whether it's, um, you know, slow uh, migration into the business, but just basically some some techniques or habits or principles to um, engender that stewardship kind of followership, if you will? Good question. Impossible to answer. <laughs> the uh, let me think the. Uh... What I see a lot of, I think two things I would point out. One is um, so many of our clients, when they're in their teens or early 20s, work in an internship or something in the business. And then when they're in their like 40s, 50s, 60s, they talk about that experience and they continue to talk about that experience. I love it when folks go into their family business, ideally without their last name, and are our hourly workers or they they ran the phones or or whatever and they look because then they they see this like person next to them and instead of an associate or an employee it's it's mary and mary you know will personify for them what it is to own a business and and, and create jobs and treat mary well i just find that people do that they many not all but many hold that experience for their lifetime like yeah. undercover employees rather than undercover boss, <laughs> like yeah. just being able yeah, to get that's, in. That's right. It's just undercover. Yeah. yeah. Undercover next gens getting out there is, I find it so important. And those that don't see that, mm, that makes me worry a little bit. The second thing we do very actively, kind of like with owner strategy, you say, okay, these were, what do you think your, um, we did this once with a client. It was so, it was so useful. We, we, it was G2 to G3, right? And G2, amazing people. And we said, we had a, I interviewed the G2 in a full family meeting and basically asked the question you're asking, which, what are your stewardship values? And tell us some stories about that. And we wrote them down. And then the next family meeting, G2 was not there. It was only G3, including spouses. And we said, okay, individually, how do you see stewardship happening here? We we kind of, in a way, used, I don't know if you used uh, uh, Dennis's value card sort. They did something like that. And they said, these are these are individual values. And the next session, again, we brought the G2 and G3 together. And we said, okay, this is what G2 said. This is what G3 says. Is there a collective view of what's most important here? So we were trying to build and change. Because I always think you bring some of what the previous generation, you reject some of the previous generation, and there's just some new stuff that's that's happening and to do it in an explicit process where you say that's happening so that they know it it often happens is a little bit of how we do it jeff one thing i would add uh jeff is is to be explicit about communicating to the rising generation that passing assets is fairly easy passing relationships passing trusted relationships is really hard and it's really up to them to figure out, not for you to figure out how to do for them. They have to figure out how are you going to win the trust of non-family employees? How are you going to win their loyalty? Because it's not something that can be, it's a bequest, you know, it can't, it can't be transferred in that way. And so I think by empowering them, by, by sharing that this is probably your number one thing that will help you to be successful is develop relationships um, with those non-family employees, but I think they need to own it. And it's not really something that the senior generation can, can, uh, I mean, senior generation can be helpful, but ultimately the rising generation needs to know that they're going to be held, first of all, to a higher standard an unreasonably high standard by non-family employees, especially when they join the company and that they need to be okay with that that we need to normalize why that is, but then we need to encourage them to say, look, yes, we can pass ownership to you, but what we can't pass is 
the relationships, the, the, the loyalty. And so that's something that you're going to have to naturally work on um, with those people. So anyways, ho- hopefully that, that was helpful. Can I add Thank to you. Dave? I think it's a, yeah, go ahead. It's such a cool thing. I think the other thing that often is happening is uh, being explicit and permissible with different roles. There's this, oh, you got to work in the business. I don't want to work in the business or, oh, you got to be on the board. I don't want to be on the board. Is that an okay dialogue to have? We we often try to open up the role discussion with people and say, as an owner, there are many ways to influence a family business. Being in the business is one of them, but not the only one. And I find opening up that permissibility is a super important thing because otherwise you're kind of living in someone else's house to go back to Dave's analogy. Um, yeah. And there's one other thing that I've learned a lot about is, uh, which is related, but a little bit different from where we are, which is entitlement. Oh, the next generation's so entitled. And I'm a little bit harsh on this one, which is I think entitlement is mostly a function, if it exists, it would be mostly a a function of, of parenting, not of next generation behavior. And I find that those folks who don't think of themselves as great parents, for whatever reason, good or bad, there's often an assumption that the next generation is entitled. Um, Rob, I'll have to send you the article I wrote. It's called Entitlement Begins With Me. And it's, it's oh, exactly super. that. Oh, super. It's good. basically good. like take 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 ownership. I mean, we can't point the finger of scorn at our kids. I mean, we have made choices that either are en- totally enabling true. that or encouraging that or not. So anyways, yeah, that's a tough one though. It's a tough one to un- disentangle. Yeah. It's like you prove you're not entitled. Like, oh, well, I'm going to live in Alaska in a tent <laughs> without any heat. <laughs> well, I want you to be in the family business. <laughs> you're like, okay, let's talk. Um, let's, let's go to a couple more questions. Um, Asin, if you're able, would you take yourself off mute and ask your question to Rob? Rob, hi, I'm really enjoying the session today, so thank you very much. Um, Quick question here. You know, a lot of the families I'm working with right now, uh, there's a situation where the first generation are the creators that, you know, they they, they built this business. Mm -hmm. They understand the nuts and bolts of the entire enterprise very, very well. Second generation probably has an interest to do something else. They're, they're, they're running different professions and so on and so forth. They're going to inherit ownership. G1 is thinking, how are these guys going to own this company when they don't understand the nuts and bolts? And they don't trust G2 to be able to run this enterprise, not understanding the nuts and bolts. And how does G2 become an, an effective, competent owner yeah. in the eyes of G1 yeah. or for themselves? when they don't understand the nuts and bolts. And I'm curious to see your perspective. No softball questions for you today, Rob. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that one's easy. <laughs> um, that's such a good question. I don't, the, well, we, I don't think you have to be an owner operator. I just don't. And the problem might be similar to this entitlement thing that we're just talking about, which is the G1 has a mindset that the only way you can be a good owner of something is if you run it. I don't believe that. I don't, I have like dozens, I don't know. Let's just take a small example. Do any Waltons work at Walmart? (laughs) I don't think so. I think one does maybe. It's a pretty good business. So how did they do it? You know, well, they're upstairs in the owner room in the boardroom, right? And there was a whole, there's, I'm sure it, I'm sure there's a whole path, you know, to get there. So showing some counter examples of great businesses that are that are no longer G1 owner operators. The um, Mars family, does any, I don't know, do any of the Mars family, the Cokes work in their business? I'm just taking the you know the top five in, in the States and kind of running through them. They don't, <laughs> it's quite, is kind of the answer. And then you say, it, is that okay? Are we big enough to have a board? Are we big enough to have an owner room? All of those things. The other thing is maybe the G2, I hope, I'm sure that they're being asked, do you want to own it together, G2? Because it could be that it's not in their life plan 
you know, hey, G1, great job. We love it. But it's not really something that we're interested in. I don't know if they're saying that or they're saying it's the role conversation. There are many ways to be an effective owner and you don't have to be an owner operator to be one. That, that's my that's my gut, but I'm sure that's not particularly helpful. <laughs> I, I would add a scene that um, owner operators, I think, struggle to respect at the same level someone that's not an owner operator. And so I, I agree with Rob that we need to find examples of and, and let them know that, yes, the business is going to be different. I mean, if it's not being run by an owner operator, it will it will be be different. It may have different objectives too, like Rob talked about earlier. And is that okay? You know, these are all really disruptive things for a, for a, for G one especially to swallow. You know that 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 this is going to work, and it's going to also probably be very different. Um, thank you for your question, Asin. Uh Let's get to one more. Julia, would you like to come off mute and ask your question? Julia, are you able to join us? Okay, there you go. I'm not able to hear you, Julia. Let's see. Oh, that tricky mute I, button. Again. <laughs> I will ask your question for you unless you can. Okay. Uh, Julia asks in the in the chat, should there be requirements for the next generation family members who want to be involved in the business? If so, how is that managed? And who's res who's really responsible for implementing it? Oh, big time. There should be uh, clarity. I, I Requirements, yes. But let me go deeper, at least in my mind, than that, which is uh, so we deeply believe that um, it's great for family members to work in the business, but it's terrible for family members to work in the business without clear policies and oversight. So we've seen so much damage to people who come in the family business. They throw away you know, they're at Stanford Business School and they could be working at Goldman Sachs and they negotiated something with Goldman to join. And then they join their family business instead with no understanding what they're getting into. And that's such a shame. <laughs> so uh, we actually have a whole chapter in the book about family employment policy. And I'm such a big believer in you want to make the requirements, the decisions about family employment as a policy across uh, all family members joining the business. And the way at least we think about it, it's kind of cradle to grave, which is uh, who can join, right? Some of our clients say nobody can join. Some say everybody can join or someplace in between. What are the qualifications to join? I have to be really clear. Do you need a college education? Do you have to work outside the business? These kind of things. Where can you enter? Is it only entry level you know, or is it higher? What kind of compensation will you have? Will it be like uh, any other employee? Would it be employee plus? Some of our clients have employee minus. There are all these different ways to do it. Some have, and we do not recommend this. All family members, no matter what their role, will pay, be paid the same. It's conflating ownership and, and, uh, and employment if you're doing that. Then what I think is the most important thing is, what is your developmental path? Who's going to be in charge of that? Our large clients typically will move that outside of the business, typically to the board level of some sort, maybe a nominating governance committee area, because they know that in the business, it's really hard to give the family members the kind of feedback that they need. It's because they're going to be the future boss or future owner. I'm going to softball. Now, the best way to grow up in a big company is to get your ass kicked a number of times through really good feedback systems. And we find they're usually inadequate if they're not being given uh if they're not, if they're given just through HR. And then there are two or three other things, but I'll mention just one, which is as important as all of that is to ex be explicit before you enter what your exit is. So uh, we have one client where a family member worked in the business for 20 years. He was fired and then he sued his own family business. It's like, oh my goodness, this didn't, this did not end well. Um, and exiting a family business is often a case where your identity just gets yanked out from you. And you have to anticipate that before you get there. And you have to make it so that it's okay. To, we don't view it as a lifetime job. 
Very few people nowadays have lifetime jobs. Why would this be a lifetime job? Here's an exit pa path. Here is two years to help you find that next thing. Here's how the decision is going to be made. I think all of those things have to be laid out to minimize the risk to your most important asset, which is your next generation. Rob, I think that's akin to, you know, the language that we allow people to use, like, if I die, it's like, no, it, there's not a choice. Like it's, it's <laughs> when, so everyone, you know, you may enter the business, but at some point you will <laughs> exit the business. So I think it, part of it is just even in, in the language too, not, you know, like everyone's going to exit at some point. So let's, let's talk about how that's going to look. Yeah, look at um, our, our time has flown, Rob, any, any kind of final, final thoughts? Um, we didn't get to, you know, conflict. Oh, yeah. uh, well, we didn't get to some of those that, typical things. Thank everybody for joining. It is such a cool field because, you know, we go deep in just this family business handbook, but I love the field partly because the clients are so awesome, but also because it touches so many other fields. You got to learn, you know, oh, say uh, social psychology to be good at this. You have to learn legal stuff. You got to learn group dynamics. And I can name 12 other things. And that's, it's just such a great learning journey. And I'm so impressed with people who come to such podcasts because I know that they're on a concurrent learning journey with me. Well, Rob, thank you so much for, for joining us, for sharing your wisdom and for putting in the effort to write a book. <laughs> it's not, it's not easy. And uh, I guess just, just to close, I wanted to give a little plug for next month. Um, I'll be interviewing Catherine Howe about her book about the Astor family, the rise and fall of an American fortune. Um, please do feel, feel free to join us again. We thank you so much for investing your most precious asset, which is your time and your attention. And again, Rob, thanks so much. Thank you, Dave. Everyone have a great afternoon.